After decades of fuel dependency on the Middle East and elsewhere, fracking, the high-pressure extraction of oil and gas from shale, promises to make America energy self-sufficient by 2030. So what will this new paradigm mean for the US's geopolitical ambitions, objectives and strategy in the years ahead? Texas, striking gold, black gold, goes back to the birth of the modern petroleum industry in the state. But oil production peaked here in the 1970s and declined for the next four decades. It's booming again today. Well, I think it's been a surprise to everybody. There's more oil being produced in Texas right now than there has been in many years. And the gas production has been huge. Trey Scott is president of Trinity Mineral Management. He assists landowners who lease acreage to energy companies for wells. There were companies coming in from all over the country trying to grab up acreage. It, it was like the gold rush. Scott's focus is the Eagleford Shale. Since 2008, the amount of oil being produced in the Eagleford has gone from virtually zero to one and a half million barrels a day. This is the map of the Eagleford Shale. These are all the permits uh, over the last uh, five or six years. How many wells are there that have been drilled so far in the Eagleford? Some 10 plus thousand. The Eagleford Shale stretches about 640 kilometers from the Mexican border to East Texas. It's a geological formation where oil and gas is trapped in rock thousands of feet below the surface. How much oil do you think's out here in the Eagleford? Billions of barrels. Billions of barrels. Currently, the Eagleford is the largest oil and gas investment play in the world. The boom here and elsewhere in the U.S. has implications for American policy in the Middle East and the debate over climate change. Well, the technology of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling combined is, is what has exploded exploration. That combination is known as fracking. It's a revolutionary technique to tap into oil and gas reserves by turning the drill horizontally and going out thousands of feet into a shale formation. The casing of the well is then punctured with explosives, and a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals is forced through the holes at very high pressure. This breaks apart the shale rock, creating pathways for the oil and gas to flow into the well. This right here is, is what we call a Y-block fluid in. So the high pressure fluid for fracking is coming out of here? That's correct. This man's company was pushing its fracking pumps at a Texas trade show. How's business been in the last couple of years? Amazing. It has been very, very, very good. Business is very good. We build the uh, vacuum trailers, which are used to transport mostly water in the fracking process. The fracking boom has already pumped more than two million jobs into the U.S. economy. Next year will be a huge year for the industry in North America. There was an exhibitor who helps U.S. military veterans get jobs in the oil industry. I know firsthand the mission to protect the assets you know, that supply oil you know, to our nation. He was with an Army unit that participated in Desert Storm, the 1991 U.S. operation to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. I believe that the need to deploy soldiers globally is certainly going to be impacted you know, with what is happening currently with a major shell place here in the United States. In 2013, the U.S. produced more oil than it imported for the first time since 1995. Daily output has increased 3.7 million barrels over the last five years. Fracking is giving rise to a new energy abundance in the U.S. that is reshaping the contours of American power. It has huge implications for energy, for economy, and for geopolitics. Fatih Birol is the chief economist for the International Energy Agency in Paris. The IEA is the leading energy forecasting organization in the world. I would consider the shale technology and its implications with the, the introduction of nuclear power at the same level. Why do you think it's so significant? I think I can tell you that in one or two years of time, 
U.S. will be the number one oil producer of the world, overtaking Saudi Arabia and Russia, and number one gas producer of the world. These are historical developments. The IEA projects that the U.S. and Canada will be energy independent by 2020, and the U.S. alone by 2035. The first reason is the increase in the shale oil production. Their production is increasing. But the second, and at least as important as this, is that first and second Obama administrations implemented fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks. And U.S. domestic consumption is going down. U.S. oil imports have dropped 44 percent in the last five years, and Barol thinks imports will continue to plummet. Up to now, the role of the United States as a major actor was an energy importer. But now, the role is changing. U.S. is becoming an energy exporter, completely new role, and the new U.S. energy strategy, foreign policy, will be based on this new reality. For the past 35 years, securing access to Persian Gulf oil and protecting the shipping lanes to keep it flowing has been a central tenet of American military policy. It's known as the Carter Doctrine. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interests of the United States of America. President Jimmy Carter drew the line in the sand in his 1980 State of the Union address. And such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. By the 1970s, in many respects, the American way of life rested on the availability of large quantities of very cheap energy. Andrew Basevich is a West Point graduate and served in the U.S. Army for more than 20 years. He has written several books on American foreign policy. I don't think that President Carter had any real understanding of the long-term implications of the Carter Doctrine. Uh, to my mind, this really triggered a full-scale militarization of U.S. policy in the region. What do you see as the relationship between America's need for oil and American military action? Well, there's a, direct, there's a direct connection. Although I have to say it's not simply America's need for oil. It's the developed world's need for oil. And the conviction on the part of the U.S. national security policymakers that the United States somehow should be responsible for uh, ensuring that the developed world has access to the energy that it needs. Do you think the shale oil and gas boom will cause a strategic rethinking of the Carter Doctrine? I hope it will. It seems to me that what the new energy regime uh, could do would be to make it clear that the United States does have choices. Uh, and one of those choices will be to lower our profile uh, in, the, in the Middle East more broadly and in the Persian Gulf specifically. Last year, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly examined the geopolitical implications of America's new energy abundance. This is something that is a game changer globally. Jeppe Kofad is a member of the NATO Assembly who represents Denmark in the European Parliament. He drafted the paper on the fracking boom that sparked the NATO discussion. I think it's a general perception that this is actually empowering the U.S. again to maintain a strong position in the world. Kofad says that roughly one-third of U.S. defense spending is linked to efforts to keep oil flowing. Well, I think they will do some changes in the military, for sure. Uh, less money in military in the Middle East, and they will be less willing maybe to go into a new war to uh, safeguard its own interest when it comes to oil in the Middle East. Do you think America will have more freedom dealing with the Gulf regimes and Israel? There's no doubt that it will strengthen the independence, so to speak, of, of U.S. when it comes to its foreign policy. I mean, this is something that is changing the power of the OPEC countries, uh, which is good, I think. Uh, I don't see how we can talk about a oil self-sufficiency in North America. It's going to be an economic, political, and technical challenge for decades to come. Dr. Sadat al-Husseini was a top executive for more than 20 years at Aramco, Saudi Arabia's state-owned oil company and OPEC's biggest producer. He thinks the predictions about America's fracking boom are overblown. The U.S. consumes 18.5 million barrels a day, and in the last uh, recorded month, I think that was May, the U.S. still imported over 7 million barrels. Uh, the oil shales are great, but 
you're not going to be able to add another 7 million barrels of oil shale production in the U.S. The International Energy Agency says America's oil imports are going to plummet. Well, I, I can't speak for the IEA, and I don't know how they arrive at all their numbers. I mean, but they're talking about efficiency factor as well as production. Don't you think that's highly significant? I don't think it's going to happen. You have to take the numbers apart. In addition to IEA projections, the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that America has more than a 75-year supply of natural gas and over 200 billion barrels of technically recoverable oil. Don't you think that decrease in dependence on Middle Eastern oil will have an impact on American policy in the region? The only spare capacity in the world is in Saudi Arabia. 40% of the oil is in the Middle East. And at the end of the day, even the U.S. is part of the global economy. And if the global economy is suffering, the U.S. itself will suffer. So can the U.S. economy become independent of the Middle East? No, for sure. In fact, American policymakers provide assurances that the U.S. is going to continue to safeguard access to Middle Eastern oil. The United States of America is prepared to use all elements of our power, including military force, to ensure the free flow of energy from the region to the world. Although America is steadily reducing our own dependence on imported oil, the world still depends on the region's energy supply. Our policy elites are prisoners of uh, an obsolete paradigm. And the paradigm is one of America as the sole superpower, taking on responsibilities permitted to no other nation. But the world that really exists is an emerging multipolar world in which there are going to be several centers of power which are going to exercise responsibility for global order to varying degrees. It's estimated the United States spends $200 billion of its defense budget safeguarding Persian Gulf oil. Do you think that's sustainable if imports from the region decline? The problem is the money that we're spending doesn't produce the results in the Islamic world that are expected. And as an awareness of energy self-sufficiency in North America begins to sink in, then it's more likely that people will ask, what are we getting for all these military dollars? And I'm, I'm phrasing in terms of dollars, but of course it's also lives lost, lives shattered in trying to provide for the security of a part of the world that is no longer as important to us as it once was. Today, China is the biggest importer of Middle Eastern oil and is expected to get 80% of its supply there by 2030. Many analysts foresee the Chinese taking a greater role in safeguarding access to oil in the region. Mentally, American policymakers are not capable of conceiving of that. And that's unfortunate, because I think that it actually does make sense. Do we relinquish our leading role? No, why should we? Uh, this is American strategic interests and American power. No, you, you don't give up power without getting something in return. Bill Richardson served as UN ambassador and U.S. Secretary of Energy under Bill Clinton. He was governor of New Mexico from 2003 to 2011. This report linked national security policy with energy policy. A commission Richardson co-chaired issued a report this year that examined the implications of America's fracking boom for U.S. policy in the Middle East. It basically means that we have more options. But right now, the growth of uh, the Al-Qaeda's and the ISIS and uh, countries that are hostile to the United States are increasing. So we have to engage in the region politically a lot more, strategically a lot more, more of a political military presence. The American military spends some $200 billion a year safeguarding access to Middle Eastern oil. Do you think that's sustainable over the long haul? No American president, Republican or Democrat, is not going to recognize the importance of those sea lanes in the Middle East to our security. There's not going to be a, a serious decline. We still have huge political and strategic interests. Our relationships in Saudi Arabia, our military bases there, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, stability in countries like Egypt, the security of Israel is very important to the United States. The major change Richardson foresees in the short term is the use of shale oil and gas exports as instruments of American power. It allows us to advance our national security by lessening dependence of a lot of key countries that are our friends, especially in Europe, 
on Russia, on some countries in the Middle East that use oil as a weapon, like Iran. But America has had a ban on oil exports since 1975. And currently, Chenier Energy is constructing the first terminal in the U.S. capable of converting natural gas into liquid natural gas, LNG, for export. It won't be operational until 2015. Politicians in the energy industry are pushing hard to get more export terminals online. Rarely in Congress do we get chances to pass legislation that creates economic opportunities here at home, strengthen and help our allies around the globe, weaken our enemies, and not spend the American taxpayers' money all at the same time. Opponents argue unbridled exports would harm the economy by driving up energy prices at home. The one edge our manufacturers have in this country is cheap energy. And we're about to take that from them, too. With Russia cutting off gas supplies again to the Ukraine, Hungary's ambassador for energy security, Anita Orban, appeared before Congress to weigh in on the export side. We are in the middle of the largest security crisis that Europe has seen since the end of the Cold War. Europe relies on Russia for 30 percent of its gas supplies and half transits via the Ukraine. Some countries like Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic are even more dependent, getting anywhere from 70 to 100 percent of their gas from Russia. Energy is, of course, a huge part of the Ukrainian crisis. We met Ambassador Orban at the Foreign Ministry in Budapest. The goal of the European Union is that to diversify its suppliers. Significant exports of American gas to Europe are going to take several years. Can it affect energy markets now? It can. We have numerous examples where the certainty of a new source, new route coming on board in a couple of years down the line has an immediate price impact. Do you think American gas exports to Europe could promote domestic reform in Russia? Yes. More competition on the gas market could lead to changes in the Russian economy. Russia is very much reliant on revenues from oil and gas. Do you expect to see significant American gas exports to Europe? More gas may go from the United States to Asia, but that can free up other suppliers who can then target the European market. In fact, U.S. companies stand to make considerably more from exporting natural gas to Asia than to Europe. The Obama administration began a geopolitical reorientation to Asia in 2011. Is the pivot to Asia, in your view, connected to potential new markets for American natural gas? Yes. Yes, it, it is. Japan and South Korea depend on exports. They're our military and strategic friends. You go to Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand, all those countries want less dependence on China. They want energy relationships with the United States. Do you think anything can make the fracking boom go bust? The odds are very slim. I mean, we have a huge supply of shale. But whatever the implications of the fracking boom are for American foreign policy, the real argument is all about the environment. Some experts argue shale gas can help reduce the greenhouse effect by replacing coal. Richardson believes that fracking can be good for the environment. I think that technology has advanced so much that you can find this shale and, and, and with proper regulation do it safely. And you think that's going to win over citizens? Slowly, yeah. But the number of Americans who are concerned about the potential hazards of fracking is growing. As we all lose if the gas industry gets to use our drinking water to frack the bedrock beneath our homes. There is a moratorium on fracking in New York, and citizens are fighting for bans in Texas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and other states. In July, anti-fracking activists gathered in Washington to oppose the export of natural gas. One of the goals is to export LNG to Asia and Europe, and that's going to make us energy independent? It makes no sense at all. If we really were concerned about energy independence, we would not export this gas, and we would focus on forms of energy that actually enhance our security. We switch faster and faster to wind and solar. If we're going to stabilize our global climate, we have to keep 80 percent of all the known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. The focus of the protest was a natural gas terminal in Cove Point, Maryland. Used in the past to import natural gas, there is a plan to transform it into a major LNG export facility. Stop Cove Point! The protesters believe that stopping Cove Point will reduce fracking in America's mid-Atlantic region. After you frack, it's got to go somewhere. We don't have ways of moving it, selling it, distributing it. It's not going to work. 
Robbie Cross and his local group, the RDA, are fighting against fracking in Pennsylvania. I'm from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and there's over 500 wells drilled so far in Lycoming County. They're planning to drill a lot more. And if they put Cove Point in, they'll be drilling in everybody's backyard. The Marcellus Shale is unusually thick in the Lycoming County area. The industry refers to it as the sweet spot. Harvey Katz is another member of the group trying to stop fracking in Pennsylvania. So all this area we're flying over is the Marcellus Shale? Yes. The Marcellus Shale is the second largest natural gas find in the world. It covers 246,000 square kilometers across eight states. Okay, now that looks like a pad that's actually being fracked right now. Each one of those yellow containers down there holds 22,000 gallons of, of water or liquid. As a general rule, they use between three to five million gallons per well. That adds up to billions of gallons of water for the wells in the Lycoming County area alone. Scattered around the mountaintops were large holding ponds with water for fracking. And then in addition, every time uh, one of these drilling pads, plus all its associated roads and gathering lines are put in, it means more of our forests are cut. Well, right now we're looking over uh, uh, one of the last uh, remaining intact forests in Pennsylvania. Hiking, fishing, hunting are all here. Do the oil companies want to get in here and jump? Oh, yes. And, uh, they're, they just can't wait to get in here. We are pretty darn close to drilling it out within the next few years. Tad Patzik is the chairman of the Petroleum Engineering Department at the University of Texas. He has analyzed thousands of wells in the Marcellus and Eagleford shales. We looked at production data from all horizontal wells in the Guildford. Patzik says that unlike conventional wells, the productivity of a fracked well drops off quickly. It goes up, peaks, and then declines by 70 percent in the first year. In the second year, the decline is 50 percent, and then the decline is lower, but the production level is also very low. So there's a very steep decline there? Yes, on average, yes. Well, that's what the field data say. I, I, that's why we need to drill so many wells. That's why it's so expensive. According to Patzik, the cost of wells and drop-off in production are severe limitations on the oil and gas that is recoverable in the United States. The talk about it is exaggeration. That doesn't detract from the fact that it is a huge resource, and it will serve this country for decades, but not at the rate we expect it to, to perform. I think what you're saying is, is production may be able to be revved up. Yes. But then after it's revved up, it's going to drop down again, and so you're going to be back to a status quo situation. Yes. We need to start thinking long term, which we never do. We can't. The U.S. is not about long term. The U.S. is about tomorrow. I think the future is pretty positive. I think the next five to 10 years are, are looking very good. And what about after that? It's hard to say how technology is going to keep up and how technology is going to advance. There are other formations to be exploited. And if we can get another five or 10 out of it, I think we've done pretty good. Do you think that citizen opposition can put a brake on shale oil and gas development? I think that's the only thing that will, that together with the science. This is our struggle now, to shepherd our elected officials and our policymakers toward renewable energy. That's what we have to do. We are creating jobs and we can protect the environment. In the end, I think the will of the American people, which uh, has a strange way of expressing it in elections, uh, will, will be towards what's in the best security and foreign policy interest. And that clearly, clearly, is exporting natural gas and oil. The good news story, at least potentially good news story, is that strategically the United States is going to face an array of choices that we previously didn't see as available to us. The bad news story is that the impact of abundance of natural gas and oil through fracking is to make it easier for Americans to ignore this debate over global climate change. And I think that 100 years from now, we may regret that.